your love upon Jesus right now. Come on, pour it at his feet.
Let's just lift our hands to Jesus. Lord, we love you. We thank you. Thank you for all you've done today, all you did last night. We come again, Lord, asking for fresh bread, fresh bread from heaven, you. We're after you, Lord. Thank you for being after us. We love you. You're wonderful and beautiful. We love you. Oh, just love on him for a moment. Just take about 30 seconds to just lift your voice and love him. Jesus, we love you. You're wonderful. So beautiful, so kind, so tender. There is no one like you. There is no one like you. Beautiful Jesus, how we love you. How we love you. Amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord praise. Come on. Amen. Amen. Let's grab a seat. Can we let the uh, Jesus Image worship team know how grateful you are? So beautiful. So good. You guys ready for more? Ready for more? More of the wonder of Jesus? What a morning. Wow. Thank you, Lord. Anybody preaching the gospel outside this building? Has anybody been sharing Jesus since you've been here? Let me see some hands if you've seen some breakthrough out there. Thank you, Lord. I'm, I'm about to start uh, checking out the testimonies from our children's meetings. I'm really excited about those. Eric Gilmore is with us this afternoon. And um, Eric is a dear, dear friend of mine, a dear friend of our ministry. For you Jesus School students, you guys call him Uncle Ernie. There is a backstory to that we don't have time to get into. But he's dear to us, and um, he's family here. He and his wife, Brooke, are amazing. They're precious. And Eric, I believe, carries something. He really embodies what this gathering is all about every year, which is the beauty of Jesus. I feel that uh, you, you are about to hear, in my opinion, the most important... Uh, truth that you could ever hear, which is this, that loving Jesus is everything. And um, so I want us to shake off the carbs you had for, for lunch and, and set your heart. And um, I want us all to just very honorably receive my dear friend, a mighty, mighty man of God and a dear example to Jesse and I and an inspiration. Please welcome Eric Gilmore to Jesus 19. Would you do that? Hallelujah. Ha, where's all the Jesus School students at? Let me see your hands. <laughs> Listen, if you are thinking about coming to Jesus School, stop thinking about it and do it. There is nothing like it. Choosing to take time out to only look at Jesus for an extended period of time with other people who want to do the same thing. It's the wisest decision you can make, okay? I want to start off by saying that. Um, I do also want to say it is a high honor of my life to be able to 
have your attention during this time. I recognize that you opening your ear to hear is a humble act to sit here and say, I'm going to listen. And this is how we receive the word of God. The scripture tells us that we receive the engrafted word through humility. So the humility of listening. I just want to say thank you so much for an open ear and an open heart. What I'm going to talk about today, I feel, as Michael said, is the crux of the matter. It's the foundation. It's the center. It's the yoke of Christianity. What I mean by yoke is the center of all things. Though many things will be said from this pulpit, I believe that everything that will be said from the pulpit has underneath it the very thing we're going to be talking about right now, which is what Michael uh, just, just said. Loving Jesus is everything. So let me pray. Father, I know that I'm nothing more than a billion needs for you. And all of these words, Lord, they belong to you. And because you live, so they do. So make yourself audible, I pray. Tangibly intelligible. Amen. I'll start off with a fun fact. Did you know that Beethoven said that God is an ocean depth of happy rest? An ocean depth of happy rest. I remember when Madison, my youngest, my oldest daughter was young, she was standing in front of the ocean as a toddler and I was standing behind her. So she stands there looking at this shoreless sea and then she stoops down to take into her hands some of the sea and bring it back to me. And when she turned around to bring me back some of the sea, by the time she got to me, she only had wet hands. <laughs> That's exactly how I feel today. I feel as if I have stood before the ocean depth of happy rest and clasped into my hands a little bit of the sea to bring to you. And though there may not be much left, I pray you can see in my glistening hands some evidence of the ocean depth of happy rest, God himself. That's my prayer today. If there be anything that is happening to you in this conference, let it be this. Let it be that you see Jesus fresh again. For he's the beginning and he's the sustaining and he's the end. I wish to speak to you about Jesus and Jesus only. I'm not here to talk about us and I'm not here to talk about this life. I'm here to talk about him who transcends both us and everything that can happen to you in this life. His name is Jesus. And I'm speaking to you specifically about him because I believe that the greatest need right now is a larger vision of the king in his beauty. This is the greatest need that you have individually and that we have collectively. It was T. Austin Sparks who said, the day came when I saw Jesus and then everything else became like nonsense. You know, it was 90 years ago that T. Austin Sparks prophesied this. He said, near the end, the testimony of Jesus will be by those to whom he is everything and to whom he is all in all. They will gather into him in prayerful fellowship and eat spiritual food to engage in ministry raised up to meet the testimony of Jesus. I believe that's who you are. Those of you in this, this room, you have come to the time when there is only one thing to preach, there is only one name to be lifted, there's only one message. I believe with all my heart that soon every pulpit, every book will be about the bridegroom. I'm telling you that soon there'll be no more emphasis. They'll all just vanish. You hold it next to the feet of Christ and it disappears. I'm telling you, and I, I'm not a prophet nor the son of a prophet, but I will tell you this. 
There is a day coming, and I believe it, it now is, that the king shall have all of the attention. I, I, I feel it just so deeply in my, in my bones, and I've come to encourage you to fill your life with the beholding of the king and his beauty. I've come to encourage an endless preoccupation with the Lord himself. And the preoccupation I'm talking about is giving your attention so to him that when other things come to give, get your attention, you say, I don't have it to give to you. It's already been given. I think this is very important for us. So over and over again, his beauty will cause you to freely surrender the rights of your life. This is how you stay low, this is how you stay broken, this is how you stay filled with the Spirit, is over and over throwing everything down at the feet of Jesus and letting him become everything. Do you remember in the book of Revelation when John looks at Jesus and he sees him and falls as dead? Do you remember this? It's a beautiful picture to show what happens when you look unto Jesus. He renders everything else powerless. That's the key to walking in victory. That's the key to experiencing all that he is in our lives. So I believe the church rises and falls altogether dependent upon her view of Jesus. And I believe your life will rise and fall all dependent upon your view of Jesus. See, when you look to him, you will see him. And when you see him, you'll be stricken breathless by the overwhelming conviction that he is unlike anything you have ever seen before. I believe with all my heart that the highest place in heaven is the feet of Jesus. And the only way to live in the earth the only way to live as they do in heaven on the earth is to do on the earth what they do in heaven. And that is to be at the feet of Jesus. I've come with a clarion call to call every man, woman, boy, and girl to the feet of Jesus. Because here you'll find everything that you need in his person. Oh, the ministry of his feet. People want this ministry and that ministry. What about the ministry of the feet? When you can go low and, and find him. It was Samuel Rutherford who wrote in one of his letters of counsel. He said, I find that his sweet presence eats away all the bitterness of sorrow and suffering. I'm telling you, if we learn to prize his feet, nothing in this world can be bitter to us. Why? Because in him you find the fulfillment of all desires. See, at his feet, we take our place as nothing and we give him his place as everything. That's why it's so significant to come to the feet of Jesus. And I've said it before and I'll say it again, that there are no brighter eyes nor fairer face than those who give Christ his proper place. What are we looking for here? <laughs> what are we looking for here? We're looking for a people who are at his feet. When you're at his feet, you never have to be anything because you've bowed beneath him who's everything. When you start trying to be something, that means you're no longer nothing. And when you're no longer nothing, he cannot be everything. If he's everything, that means you must be nothing. And if you want him to be everything to you, then you must choose to be nothing. It was Martin Luther who said, God created the world out of nothing, and if God is gonna create anything out of me, I must first become nothing. You say, Eric, I just don't understand, like, what are you trying to say by being nothing? I'm trying to say what Andrew Murray said when he said, a man who has lost himself in finding God no longer compares himself with anything or anybody else. You've literally been lost in the person of Christ. Here's the root of most people's problems. They're still in the equation. When you see him, you're lost in him. And being lost in him is the only way to find everything. Oh, Jesus, I worship you. So 
If I refuse to be nothing, then I inevitably reject him as everything. See, the wedding is the bridegroom everything to the bride who's nothing. The everything only marries a nothing. They belong together. <laughs> we cannot keep our lives and marry him too. So the two become one. That's the loss of yourself in another. That's marriage. That's the marry me from the voice of the Son of God. Marry me means please lose all in me and let me be all to thee. <laughs> this means I look to you now for peace and I look to you now for joy. Not my spouse, not my friends, not my money. I look to you to be the source of joy and satisfaction in my life. It must come from you. And I'm telling you, people that live like this, they're free, man. They're free. So the number one reason why most people don't want to marry Jesus is because they don't want to forsake everything else. But when you get married, you say that wonderful phrase, forsaking all others, keeping only to thee. I want you to turn, if you can, to Revelation chapter 22, verse 17. I believe this is where we are right now. What do you mean by right now? I mean this stage of the story. Revelation chapter 22, verse 17 says this. The spirit and the bride say come. Did you hear it? Do you recognize what those words mean? The spirit and the bride have one cry. This is the last time that the church is mentioned and she's labeled a bride. This means this is where it is all heading to seeing him as the lover of your soul. This is where it all ends to recognize him as the bridegroom. The spirit and the bride say come. The final cry is a cry of love. The final cry, a Maranatha, come quickly, Lord Jesus, is telling us that he is greater than everything in this world. That's what we see here in Revelation 22, verse 17. It reminds me of Shakespeare's words when he talked about a man in love and the man being so taken with love says, how weary, stale, flat, and unprofitable seem to me all the things of this world. So it is with those who have fallen in love with Jesus. They cannot love the world anymore because they got no love to give. It's weary to me. It makes me tired. It's flat. It's got no taste to it. Stale and it's very unprofitable to me. What? Anything you've got in this world next to him. You put it next to the feet of Jesus and you watch it disappear. That's the Christian life. So the bridal cry is united with the spirit. Some theologians actually say it should be the spirit in the bride. Either way, it's a glorious union cry for one person, Jesus the lover. <laughs> so it is love for him that has moved the bride to leave everything else and find everything in him alone. Man, Juliet's words to Romeo come to mind <laughs> when she says, all my fortunes I lay at your feet and follow you, my Lord, around the world. I wonder, do you love him? I wonder, is, has your heart been captivated with love for him that you could say, all my fortunes and future, I lay at your feet and I'll follow you around the world. Wherever you want me to go, that's where I'll be. This is the kind of relationship that he wants with you. And it doesn't matter your vocation, this is what he wants with you. You say, oh, Eric, but I've never cast out a demon before or I've never healed the sick before. I've never even preached a message well, that, that whole thought just makes my heart smile. The reason why is because what kind of a relationship do you think that he wants with you? Suppose, suppose a man has a wife and she cannot cook at all. She's terrible at cooking. So he hires a maid who's fantastic at cooking. Which of the two women do you think hold his heart? The one who can cook? Or well, the one who can't cook, probably can't even keep the house clean, but she loves him. What are you saying, Eric? I'm trying to say that Jesus doesn't love you because you can preach. 
He doesn't love you because you can cast out a devil. He doesn't love you because you can pack out a stadium or you lead people to the Lord. That's not why he loves you, because he doesn't marry to get a washwoman. He, he's, not, he's not marrying you so that he can get a good meal from you. He marries you because he loves you and he's taken with you and he wants all of your love. That's a bride, my friends. A living bride who loves a living Christ. You see, the eyes of the Lord search throughout the entire world looking into the hearts of men to find which one is completely his. That means he's a lover looking for full-hearted love. Matthew chapter 25 says that when the king returns, he returns as bridegroom. So if he returns as bridegroom, what's he looking for? A bride. When that great call comes out and it says, behold, the bridegroom come out to meet him. I'm telling you, when you come out to meet him, it'd be good that your heart is in love with him. Because if you come out to meet him without a heart of love, you're, you are not bride. But I did many things. It does, these things don't matter when it comes to what the core desire of Jesus is. He's looking for a bride. He's not returning for warriors. He's not returning for Olympians. He's not returning for theologians. Listen, if he was returning for warriors, he'd be looking for the best fighters. If he was returning for Olympians, he'd be looking for the highly trained. If he was returning for theologians, he's looking for the most studied. But he's coming back for a bride, a bride who says, all my journeys have ended in meeting you. I have nothing else to even look for, for I have all my treasures in one. And it's in you that I find all that I desire. The bride looks neither here nor there because in him she's found everything that she could ever imagine. A.W. Tozer said, when a man meets God, he's not looking for anything because he's found it. Mother Besselia Schlink said, you are here. What more could I want? Oh, to have him is to have all. His desire is for loving affection a loving affection that gladly surrenders the rights of its own life to him. This is what I feel the Lord is saying tonight or today. Please don't withhold your affection from me. Don't, don't just, don't hold back your love from coming to me. Because not only is it what he wants, but it's what you need. It's the key for your heart becoming soft and staying soft is, oh, here's all my love, Lord. Sometimes I feel in my own heart, it starts to get hardened up. And I can tell this when love isn't erupting anymore. We're gonna talk about this a little further because I feel it's very, very important. In Song of Solomon, we see a starry-eyed bride and a romantic king do we not? And if the starry-eyed bride and the romantic king are talking one to another with love, we know by this that this is an exposition of what Jesus wants with us. In Song of Solomon chapter 5, verse 2, we see something very interesting. We see that she has somehow left him, and in this having left him, he comes looking for her. Have you ever had the Lord come looking for you? These are very special moments. The Lord comes looking for her. <laughs> Listen to this. This is incredible. He comes and he knocks. You see, this is how Jesus is. He's very gentle. He doesn't kick the door down. He wants you to, by, by your own will, yield and let him in. So he knocks. Will you let me in? He's like light coming into a, a room. He only comes in to the degree that he's not obstructed. So he comes and he knocks at the door. Why do you knock on somebody's door? You knock to get their attention and for them to let you in. We see Laodicea has this same thing happening with them. Jesus comes and knocks. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. This means that because he's knocking on the Laodicean door, it means that he no longer has all their attention. This is why they've become lukewarm. There's the definition of lukewarmness. Jesus has been eclipsed. Something else 
has your attention other than him. So very similarly, in verse 3, the bride starts becoming lazy towards him. In other words, he says, open up, and she doesn't want to take off her dress. She becomes lazy towards him. In other words, she's content not to have him come close. There's a lot of Christians that live this way, just being around him. Nobody gets pregnant holding hands, let me just tell you. <laughs> just in case you were wondering. <laughs> when he knocks, she knows who it is, but she's forgotten his beauty. Man, and how often the name of Jesus can become stale in our mouths. So how often can he be treated as common? How often do we become numb to the name of the Lord Jesus? How often do we become numb to his voice and numb to all that is? Christmas just passed and there's people, you know, sitting around saying, radiant beams from thy holy face. Radiant beams from thy holy face. This is, to me, it's, it's just a shocker. Like, did you hear what you just said? This can happen to us because things get common and we're just like, oh yeah, radiant memes, beams from his holy face. Robert Murray McShane says, I bask in his beams. This is what I long for. I know it's what you long for too, so I've come to encourage you. So, for some reason, or for some of us, we can't remember the last time we actually wept at the feet of Jesus. I'm telling you, this is, a, this is not good. Because dry eyes a lot of times mean a dry heart. We've become like Simon who let Jesus into his house, but he gave him no water for his feet, nor did he give him a kiss. Jesus says, I got a word for you, Simon. Simon's like, shoot, give it to me. Jesus says, I came into your house. You gave me no water for my feet. You didn't even greet me with a kiss. But this woman, and I'm telling you, there are these that are like Mary, who while Simon stands far off, she comes close. She's got no water, so she washes his feet with her tears. She dries them with her hair, and she can't stop kissing him since he came in. I know that's you. Are you a Mary? I'm telling you, you don't want to be a Simon. It's very easy to be at, the, at Jesus 19 and be content to have Jesus in your house. He's come here. But you give him no kisses. You withhold your affection from him. I'm telling you, the Lord is saying, will you let me kiss you? Because if you don't let me kiss you, there's no way for you to love me. It's these kisses that cure your soul. So, I don't know about you, but my life's goal is to give him the love that is equal to his worth. I want to give him the love that's equal to his worth. So in verse 4, we're going through this quickly, but in verse 4, she doesn't want to get up to be with him, right? So he reaches his hand through the door. He knocks. She won't open. He puts his hand through. He's reaching through like, do you remember me? Do you remember my beauty? His hands represent his works. Do you remember when I saved you and pulled you up from the pit? Do you remember when the spirit came from my hand into your life? Do you remember my beauty and the times that we've had together? Look at me. And once she sees his hand, the scripture says, then her feelings were aroused for him. Do you see the word used there? Feelings. Oh, people don't want to talk about feelings these days. There's all kinds of sliding against feelings. But I'm telling you, you can try as hard as you can. You can't separate love from feeling. I'm sorry. <laughs> you can't. Lack of feeling means you've grown stale, bro. It means you're stagnant. Her negligence and her laziness towards the Lord was connected to her lack of feeling. And then she feels and she can remember who he is. 
Charles Spurgeon said, only a corpse is without feeling. I don't care about feelings. You're dead. That's why. Paul tells us that this is how you will know if the Spirit is at work in your life. Love, joy, peace. Are those, you guys interested in feelings that you can't feel? Love, you want a love that you can't feel? No. You want peace you can't feel. I got peace. Do you feel it? No. What is going on? The Holy Spirit gives you love, joy, peace. These are feelings. To be unfeeling is to be unfruitful. It's very important. You say, oh, Eric, but I'm doing all kinds of ministry. I've got my Bible study that I'm doing. I I lead in the church. G. Campbell Morgan said, no amount of activity in the king's service can make up for the neglect of the king. We must give all of our feelings, all of our emotions. See, your feelings move you to make room for him. I've had many times in my life where I feel my heart is getting hard towards the Lord and life is crowding me in and there's so many things going on. And all of a sudden, from the inside, a love begins to burst up and say, no, I will go be with you. I will shut down whatever I've got to shut down. Let everything fall if it may. I'm going to be with you. And I don't care if stuff falls through the cracks or people don't like me. I will be with you, my God. I will set it out. I'll block it out. I will make room for you. This is the kind of love that keeps a man. If you don't have this deep love, God will give it to you today. It comes by a gaze. You see him once, you love him forever. One glimpse of him can change your definition of sin to giving the attention he deserves to things far inferior to him. One glimpse of him. You see, when she goes to find him, the scripture shows us that she knows exactly where he is. She goes, he's in his garden. (laughs) Chapter six, he's in his garden. Chapter eight says he waits in the garden. This garden represents communion. He he loves to commune with you in this. There's a garden of communion and This beautiful garden is what she's running to because she knows that he waits for her there. Can you see the picture? Jesus is sitting in the garden of communion waiting for you. And people are passing by. They they see Jesus there and they look at He's still waiting for her. Jesus, she's not coming. Jesus says, I'm not going anywhere. This is the only place she knows where to find me. I'm telling you, maybe you're here and God's been calling your name and he's been saying, come be with me, come away with me. I'm telling you, he's not gonna leave the garden. He's still there just like the first day he called to you. And I encourage you to run away to that garden and enjoy him. He waits to be wanted and often he does wait in vain, but not with us. We are those who refuse to let him wait in vain. We're coming, coming Lord, yes Lord, I'm coming. This is the crux of my message, okay? Right here. When she's going to be with him, she's stopped by these guys. And these guys stop her and they say, what is your beloved compared to other beloveds? In modern English, it'd be like, what's so special about this guy? You're running to be with him. What's so special about him? Listen to what she says. It's in verse 10 of chapter five of Song of Solomon. She says, my beloved is dazzling. What's so special about this guy? He's dazzling. This word is incredible. It means to be so overcome with light or beauty that natural consciousness is suspended. He dazzles me. What's so so special about him? Why do you love him? Because he makes me forget everything else but him. He's the only thing I can see when I look at him. Everything else takes a far second and vanishes when I look into his face. He dazzles me. (laughs) He dazzles me. Dazzle me, God. Dazzle me. Say this. Say, God, dazzle me. 
See, in the sight of him, rubies turn to toys and emeralds, sordid dust, praise is worthless noise, and mansions are morbid rust. A sight that makes you say, a hymn, a song, when I see you, for you are the theme of every dream I ever knew. This is what seeing Jesus does to the human heart. Why do I love him? <laughs> because he's pure light. There's no darkness in him. He's innocent and he's undefiled. He's separated from sinners and exalted above the heavens. He's greater than the angels and he's higher than the priests and every knee will bow to his exalted seat. There's seven stars in his hands and every crown is at his feet. Complete and perfect are his ways. He's the ancient of days. The earth and sky flee from his face. He's a person, a taste, a resting place, a refuge for any case. Oh, Oh, hasten the day when my faith shall be sight and because he is bright my clothes become white why do I love him because he's brightness extreme and he's a bleeding dream that's why and because of the greatness of his majesty to give attention to anything else is the greatest tragedy she says he's the chiefest among 10,000 Charles Spurgeon says, there's no such word as chiefest, but such is the weight of Christ's perfection that he breaks down vocabulary and causes men to make up words they've never known to articulate something they've never seen. <laughs> He's magnificently beautiful. One glimpse shifts men's lives, delivers from drugs instantaneously delivers from a lifetime of depression and oppression, one glimpse of him will set you free. And then you live by the same, looking unto Jesus, and he authors and finishes your faith. What is your job? Just look. But I gotta, no you don't, look, and he'll author you, and he'll bring you all the way to, to completion. What is the weight that so easily entangles anything that stops you from looking? Just look and you will live. You say, he's the chiefest among 10,000. 10,000 what? Well, 10,000 whatever you want. <laughs> 10,000 shepherds pale in comparison to the good shepherd. 10,000 doctors stand in awe of the great physician. 10,000 kings are forgotten next to the king of kings. 10,000 angels drop their swords before the captain of the host of the Lord. 10,000 preachers stand mute next to the living word. And 10,000 lovers could never captivate your heart like Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, and again Jesus. Let him be proclaimed. Let Christ wear the crown. <laughs> After her exhaustive list of how beautiful he is, she gives her summary statement. If you put everything that she said about him in a funnel, what would come out the bottom is this. He is altogether lovely. What does that mean? It means every single thing about him is desirable. He's like a giant magnet pulling your entire being to him. He's the fulfillment of every single desire. He's more than everything you could ever want or even imagine. He dazzles you. And then Christianity changes from trying to behave to just beholding. See, marrying him means nothing is fighting with him for your attention. It means he holds your attention without competition. And then life becomes so simple. Struggling is replaced with snuggling and wrestling is replaced with nestling. <laughs> We find that the bridegroom's yoke is actually easy. It's not a sick joke. Yeah, he says it's easy, but no, when he said it's easy, he means if you're just yoked to me, it's easy. But you say, Eric, life is not light. Be yoked to Jesus and drop the other yokes and you'll find out that he's not a liar. So finding ourselves in love, we find ourselves praying less and singing more. We become more like Cinderella. <laughs> so this is love. Mm -hmm. 
Everyday chores be begin to be a chorus unto the Lord. I wash this dish for you. And I vacuum rooms for you. It's just us two. <laughs> See, he masters our will by melting our hearts. That's what he does. He doesn't trap you in a corner to try to collect your consent. He shows you how beautiful he is and he watches you crumble. He's like, you, you can't take it. <laughs> See, he says beautiful words like this, come to me and I'll give you rest. In other words, he's saying, if you come to me, I'll do the rest. This is the key, guys. It's the key. Eric, could it possibly be this good? Welcome to the gospel, my friends. Jesus, the Son of God. <laughs> this is the new covenant I shall write upon their hearts. <laughs> my law, I'll put a new spirit on the inside of them, and I'll cause them to walk in my ways. Hallelujah. There's a story of an old saint who's approached by Christ, and when he sees Jesus, he falls at his feet, and Jesus says to him, do you desire good things? The man says, yes. Jesus says, well, there's none good but me. He says, do you desire blessing? Who's more blessed than me? Do you desire wisdom? I am unto you wisdom. Do you desire life? Who else can be life to you? Do you desire help? Who else can help you but me? Do you desire riches? Well, they're all hidden in me. Do you desire light? I am the light of the world. Do you desire joy? I'm anointed with joy above all my fellows. Do you desire peace? Well, I'm the prince of peace. And do you desire beauty? Who's more beautiful than me, Jesus says. So Lord, dazzle me broken, dazzle me blind, dazzle me open, dazzle my mind. For far too long, men have played with sparks when God gives us his dazzling sun. Ministering spirits turn into flames before the dazzling one. I've come to call every life, every, every person in this place to choose the ministry of the feet as your vocation. Here is your life. Here is your center. This is the reason why you live, to come to his feet. The highest ministry there is, is the feet of Jesus. You can't get any higher. I dare you to try to put your head up from his feet. You can't do it. A dear friend of mine, he's in this room right now. He wanted to get a job so he could Todd White the place, you know what I mean? Get the job, lead everybody to the Lord, healings and all that. And when he goes in to see what they got him doing, he's sweeping floors all day long, all by himself. And he says to the Lord, he says, Lord, I, I really wanted to be a witness, but I'm, I'm here and there's nobody to minister to. And he hears the Lord speak into his ear and he says, what about me? Will you minister unto me? So often our ministry keeps us from the highest ministry. So often our desire to do something gets in the way of us becoming nothing. And therefore gets in the way of Jesus being everything. So let's make 2020 the year that we've all chosen the ministry of the feet. Maybe you say, Eric, I, I want to love him, but I don't think I, I do. Well, that's a great place to be because it's okay to look at Jesus and say, I don't love you. Will you help me? As a matter of fact, that's the starting ground. As a matter of fact, I go there all the time in my own life. Once I start feeling my heart get hard, that's the first thing I say, oh Lord, help me love you. Help me give you the attention that you deserve. You know, in John chapter 11, which is one of my favorite stories, and I'm, I'm closing right here. Lazarus has died because Jesus was not there. They waited for him. He didn't show. Lazarus dies. Jesus shows up late. Check it out. He doesn't even enter into the city yet, and Martha finds him. Before he even enters the city, the scripture says that he was calling for Mary. You say, Eric, is not there. Well, when Martha goes to get Mary, she says, he's here, and he's calling for you. I looked up the word there. It means he's calling out. He doesn't even come into the city yet. He's like, I'm not even going to go into Bethany unless Mary's here. Mary! Mary! 
Why? Because he knew this woman and he knew that she would do exactly what she did. They tap her on the shoulder. He's here. She gets up immediately and she runs straight to his feet. Does she have hurt in her heart? Absolutely. Her brother's dead. Does she have pain? Does she have questions? Absolutely. But look at what she does with all the pain and all the questions. She throws it down at the feet of Jesus and says, your presence here is more important than answers. You're more important to me than being able to figure everything out. I throw myself at your feet. That's the ministry of the feet. I've come to you today like Martha, tapping on your shoulder, saying he's here and he's looking for you. I wonder if you'll get up and run to the feet of Jesus. That's what I wonder. If there might be a Mary in this room that says that's how I'm going to respond is come to the feet of Jesus. What, what does it mean to choose the feet of Jesus or the ministry of the feet? Well, to choose the ministry of the feet means that you recognize Fellowship with him is the purpose of every single day. The reason why you woke up again was so you could be with him. And from that place, through communion alone, where you receive all that you need, which is him, then you live out your daily responsibilities and manage your daily issues and speak to others from a satisfied state. That, my friends, is holiness. Holiness is the fruit of being addicted to the maximum pleasure of life, which is God himself. Holiness means I'm not looking for anything else. I've got you, and you've satisfied my soul. John Piper said sin is what we do when we're not satisfied with God. So when you find satisfaction in him, you find all. So here's my prayer for you. As a matter of fact, this is what we'll do. If you could just give us a little pad here. If you're here and you want to respond to a call that I'm giving right now, the call that I'm giving right now to choose the ministry of the feet as your primary reason for living. I want you to respond in some way. If you want to come down here, that's fine. If you want to kneel right where you are, if you want to stand and lift your hands, whatever you want to do, just respond in some way. You're saying, oh Lord, I choose your feet again. I choose your feet, that's what I want. If you want to love him and you feel like you don't, you feel like your heart is stone, throw yourself on the ground and say, help me love you, Lord. Help me love you. Choose your feet, Lord. That's what I choose. I choose your feet. I choose your feet, Lord. Don't withhold your affection from him. That's the worst thing you could do right now is withhold your affection from him. Oh, it will it will do it will do more harm than good. Just open your heart to him. Don't withhold your affection from him. He deserves all love. Let my love come before you. I honor and adore you. Let my love come before you. I honor and adore you. I love you. Let my love come before you. I honor and adore you. I pray the Lord would draw you to secluded places to obtain graces and end all the chases and fill all the spaces so nothing's wasted. Hallelujah. Lord, you are 
more precious than Just sing it out, oh Lord. Yes, yeah, sing with your heart.
weird, right here, right here.
Praise you, Lord. Praise you, great King. Praise you. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Praise you, Father. Thank you, Lord. It is good to give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. We thank you, God, for your great love. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you that you articulated who you are and you drew us back again just by the articulation of the person of Jesus. We're drawn again to the beauty of God. We thank you, Father. It's true. He's altogether lovely and altogether worthy. He's altogether lovely. He's altogether worthy. And God, we've cho chosen today that you would be our all, that there'd be Jesus plus nothing. And that we'd be fully fascinated by you all the days of our life, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your mercy. You know, Keith Green wrote the song that we're singing and he, he wrote, you know, replace the lamp of my first love. And I was just thinking about this, this song that he wrote. And I was thinking, Lord, what, what do you sing back to us, you know? He says, light the fire that once burned bright and clean. And the wonderful thing about God is that he sings back, I will. I will. I will give you your lamp. I will give you your fire. I will put my fire once again on your heart and it will be bright and it will be clean. Just stay with me, just stay with me. And so Father, I pray that today this would be sealed in our heart, that we'd stay forever fully fascinated, enraptured by the person of Jesus. You are the fullness of God and the full revelation of God. And we wanna fully know you in Jesus' name. If you love the Lord, just tell him, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We love you, Lord. We love you. What a merciful King, huh? You know what? I just feel, guys, that...